I would like to share with you um, a message on faith. What concerns me in America right now is that the church seems to be moving away from faith and the word. And if you don't study the word of God, if you don't live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, if you are not directed by the Holy Spirit, you cannot possibly do the will of God. And if you don't know the word, you are vulnerable to false teachings and false teachers. And that's, we're seeing that actually in our country today, is that many, many churches are preaching a false gospel, a gospel that doesn't reflect the truth of the word of God, but it reflects the reality of the culture in which we live. It mirrors the culture and not the Lord and his perfect word, the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so we need to know the genuine article. Remember, those who are clerks at a bank, they don't study the counterfeit. They study the real currency, the authentic currency. And so they know when any currency or any bill deviates from that perfect original currency, they will identify it immediately. And that's how we have to be with the Word of God. The United States is now a very spiritually barren place. Europe is actually worse. Isn't that interesting that Europe launched some of the greatest evangelism in the world? And it came to America, and America became the greatest evangelizers in the world. And now we have decided to step away from our roots and our faith, and our countries are suffering. Europe is turning away, has already turned away from God. It is very spiritually dead. Thank God there is a very powerful remnant in Europe. God always has a remnant, just as he has here in the United States. But America, because we have rejected God, our, our leaders, our leaders in education, our leaders in government, they have rejected the Lord, they have mocked him, they have marginalized his word, they have mocked it. And because of that, America is now a spiritually barren place. Now what's interesting is sometimes God will give us a picture of the spiritual reality by showing us a physical circumstance or reality. And so God is now going to show us what our spiritual barrenness and emptiness looks to him. And we're going to see that happen in America. America is not going to be the same again. But praise God, even though America will be a wilderness of sorts, God, for his children, he will make streams in the wilderness. So he's going to make a stream. It doesn't matter how barren the landscape looks in America. It doesn't matter what happens in the natural. God will make streams in the desert, in the wilderness for his people. And God will supernaturally feed his people. He did so for Israel in the wilderness. Sadly, Israel did not trust him. But we are the ones who trust the Lord and the just, the righteous, who we are, will live by faith. There's no room for compromise, friends. There's no, the, pep, the time for pep talks is over. The time right now is that our hands are trained for battle. The Lord will train our hands for battle because we're in a spiritual war. And the enemy is not only at the gate, the enemy is within, even within our own government within our own culture and the enemy and evil spirits have been given access to our government our popular culture our media and our educational institutions because our leaders no longer respect him and they have rejected God but praise the Lord there is always a powerful powerful remnant in this nation a prayerful remnant a remnant that loves God, a remnant that walks sacrificially in service to Jesus Christ. Amen? So the sons of Issachar, we've shared many times, understood the times and knew what Israel should do. And 
In uncertain and chaotic and confusing times as we experience now, we all at one time or another ask, Lord, what should I do in order to do the will of God? And that's the very thing that the crowd asked of Jesus Christ. What do I do for my family? What choices and decisions do I make? I have important decisions concerning my family, my children, their future. I have important decisions in the workplace to make. Lord, what do I do? And how do I do it? I don't know what to do right now. It's not settled in my heart. I don't have clear direction. I need your help. That's where God wants you to be, on your knees, with your hands raised to heaven, and your hearts looking, and your eyes looking up to Jesus. They're saying also, Lord, what do I do for the kingdom? What do I do for the church? What do I do for your body? What decisions must I make concerning my community and my country? Well, we do know one thing. The one decision we can all make is to vote. And to vote our values, to vote our biblical values. Amen? End of story. We vote the Bible. We vote the Word of God, which is the will of God. Amen? And we don't compromise. And we're not going to be liked. We're going to offend people. Not that we intentionally want to offend people, but the truth offends those who are living in evil, in deception, and in darkness. Amen? So we are not man-pleasers, we are God-pleasers, and we're here to glorify God and to please God and not men. And that's where you will take your stand. And if you take your stand and you stand in your armor and you stand against the persecution, against a culture that is becoming increasingly hostile to you as a Christian, even the workplace, if you take your stand, God will bless you and he will empower you to continue to stand because God is able to make you stand, Paul said. Amen? And you will stand in the truth and you will stand in integrity and you will stand in faithfulness to God. And as you are standing, nothing can come against you because when you walk the truth, when you live the truth, when you defend the truth, when you declare the truth, when you honor the truth of God's word, they cannot refute the truth. Amen? So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next few months and the next few weeks. There is a paradigm shift coming to this nation where everything is changing all around the world. It's, it, we just, you know, we're very insular in America. That's why I'm so blessed to see our young people travel, especially the young people, to travel to see how other people in the world actually live. They don't live the way we live. You know, I saw a picture on a, on a, uh, a news feed of the elections in Venezuela, which were rigged, and Maduro, obviously, as he usually does, he wins. And what I saw really touched my heart. One of the polling places was closed, and there was this big, it looked like a metal door. And there were people, citizens, who were banging on the door. The polls, at, I guess, should not have been closed at that time. They were closed early. And the citizens of Venezuela, who want freedom, they were pounding on the door for the poll workers to open the polls so that they could vote. Do you know people are going to prison because they are protesting and want to vote in their leaders in their nation? Do you know people are being persecuted, people are being jailed, people are losing their lives for the sake of freedom? And we take for freedom for granted. Freedom is not free, friends. Look at all the memorials at Arlington Cemetery. Freedom is not free. Amen? And so there are things worth fighting for. Fighting for our nation, but principally fighting for our family and our children and our future. Amen? So the crowd asked Jesus, what must we do? Well, they're asking the same question here. What must we do to do the works of God that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. One translation amplifies this and says, the work of God is this, that you believe, adhere to, trust in, rely on, and have faith in the one whom he has sent. And when we do so, friends, then we will know what to do. 
because you're in God's will and the Holy Spirit will always confirm the word of God and lead you and give you wisdom and guidance to do the will of God, to do what you will put on this God's green earth to do at this critical hour, this pivotal, decisive hour. You're here to witness things that only the prophets and the, and the patriarchs and the people of faith who are spiritual forebears only dreamed of seeing. And we've been sharing for years about what is happening right now. And we've gone to the scriptures, not that we're prophets. We've gone to the scriptures and we said, this is what's going to happen. Equip yourself, gird yourself, prepare yourself, strengthen yourself, strengthen feeble knees. And strengthen your hands for battle. Because there is a battle that we are in the midst of right now. Jesus said, for false Christs and false prophets will appear in Matthew 24 and perform great signs and miracles. There are people who are going to see great signs and miracles and wonders. And they're going to be of, of demonic origin. And many people, even many people who call themselves Christians, will be duped, seduced. They will be deceived by false signs and wonders and false miracle workers. And that's why we want to be close to God. This is a season to draw close to him. You draw close to him, he draws close to you. Amen? You seek him, he'll be found by you. In whatever need you have, in whatever responsibility you have before you, whatever work is before you, you will know the will of God. Because God is your father and he's not playing games with you to try to get you to guess what his will is. He's going to make it clear to you as never before because the hour is urgent. And he says to perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if it were possible. You see, I have told you ahead of time and the Holy Spirit will teach us and guide us and lead us and tell us what is yet to come. So if you're guided by the Holy Spirit and you are surrendered by the Spirit and as Paul says, you're walking by the Spirit in Galatians, you will know the mind and the heart of God concerning His will for your life and what He's doing in the world. You have a greater understanding to understand the times and to do what you need to do specifically you and also corporately as the body of Christ. So we're going to see a dr dramatic paradigm shift and God will shake the nation out of its complacency, apathy, and self-indulgence and narcissism. And that's what we see in America today, right? We are not of the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. The world has nothing to offer. The world does not give people peace. How many of you have seen people who've tasted of the world and they've seen that it is not good, that it creates more and more stress, more and more anxiety, more and more fear, more and more insecurity, more and more emotional instability, more and more drama, more and more distress, more and more unhappiness. That's what the world has to offer you. That's why God will give you his peace. He will give you what the world cannot give you. And he says that in the world, you will be troubled, okay? You will face trouble in the world. But he says, take heart. I have overcome the world. And if Jesus has overcome the world, he will enable you to live this Christian life, this consecrated life that glorifies him in your life today. He will enable you and empower you to live this life in spite of the pressures of the world, the expectations of the world, and the values of the world, which are at variance with the kingdom of God. So he said, Jesus said, there'll be great distress in the land and wrath upon his people. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. That means bewilderment, confusion, or uncertainty. And the seas and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And that's what you're going to see, more and more fear in the world. But God is going to keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is steadfast and stayed on him. If you keep your mind and your heart focused on Jesus and thanking him 
for the fact that he is your Lord, he is your Savior, our Lord is our Heavenly Father, he is our friend, he's our deliverer, he is our comforter, he is our strengthener, and he's going to be with us so we have nothing to fear. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. What does matter is how we respond to what is happening in the world because there are people who are going to be in great pain and they're going to need comfort and encouragement and strength and prayer. And they're going to need to know Jesus. And these are divine opportunities for us to reach the lost in our nation at this time. Amen? In Hebrews chapter 11, 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, King James has. But it's being sure, it's being certain of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It's certainty. It's not wishy-washy. Faith is not wishy-washy. Faith is rock solid, like the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. One version has, now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Through our sovereign Lord, our faith activates his divine power that brings salvation, wherein the righteousness of God is revealed in us, his church, his people. Faith is a verb. Do you have a mountain in front of you? How do you move forward? You faith it. How do you overcome evil? You faith it by responding in with good. You return evil with good. How do you handle your enemies that are hostile towards you and want to harm you? You faith it by trusting that the Holy Spirit's love can conquer the hearts of your enemies. And the Holy Spirit's power and his love is so great that it can flow through you irrespective of what is around you. Because the love of God out of your belly or out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water, which is the Spirit of God. And he shed abroad, abroad his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And so the love of God is within you like a fountain, like a great and mighty river. It's flowing out of you and flowing out of you. Don't obstruct it with fear and limitations in the natural realm. Don't obstruct it with cutting corners and failing to live in the truth and obeying God and his word. Amen. Let God's presence and power through the Spirit of Christ flow through you like a mighty river because it's going beyond you. If it's agape love, it will always go beyond you. We're not reservoirs. We're rivers. There was a lake that I, uh, I was aware of in, um, in Rhode Island many years ago. And there was one lake that had an inlet and an outlet. And there was always fresh water. It was a living, it was a living lake. There was lots of, of fish, lots of uh, plants and lilies and so forth. And then there was a pond next door. And it had an inlet, but it had no outlet. And it would flood and it would stagnate. And you see this film over it. It was disgusting. You wouldn't want to swim in that lake because it wasn't, it, it was toxic almost. And so we as God's people, we have an inlet and we have an outlet. Amen? And if God's pouring in, you must pour out. And that's where we serve. We keep our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. There should be no deadness in the body of Christ. There should be no complacency or indifference in the body of Christ. You keep your spiritual fervor. 
serving the Lord. And that means serving other people who are in need. Because God's gifted you to do so. God wants the gifts of the Holy Spirit to work through you to build people up. People in the church are to be edified. And even per people in the world, God can use his gifts through you to bring comfort, to bring illumination, to bring truth. Your prayers can make tender the hearts of people whose hearts are like hearts of stone. They can become like hearts of flesh because you come in the love of Jesus, which is utterly disarming. That's a life of faith. That's one who lives by faith. Amen? So faith is not about feelings. We do not live by sight. We live by faith. We don't live by appearances and what we see and what we feel and what the circumstances around us dictate to us. Remember, the eyes of our heart are to be enlightened to see the things God would have us see at this critical hour. Amen? And so do not allow your feelings to dictate your future and your decisions. Do not allow your feelings to dictate your future and decisions because if you do, you're living by sight and you're not living by faith. It's total, complete, absolute surrender to Christ and to his will. And friends, when you have the heart of Jesus... He'll give you his eyes. You will see people that, so, that are some of the most angry and nasty and disagreeable and bitter people you could ever imagine. They are filled with bitterness and unforgiveness. And God can show you these people and he shows you what he sees. And you are utterly broken with compassion and sympathy for those people. Because you see what made them that way. You see what made them bitter and angry and resentful and negative and mean and nasty. And many times you will see a broken little boy or a little girl in an adult body who's been hurt, who's been abused, who's been abandoned, who's been rejected. That's what Jesus shows you if you belong to him. And what's wonderful is then he gives you his hands to bring comfort in healing. Do you want to be an instrument of righteousness? Do you want to be an instrument of Jesus Christ? Do you want to be like the hands of Jesus that will bring healing to the sick? Strength to the weak? Transformation and restoration to the brokenhearted? You are divine instruments that God works to bring his glory and his love through to those in need. Are you getting this? Why do you think you're here? Are we here just to gratify ourselves? To do our own thing? To indulge ourselves and our egos and our prides and our selfish ambitions? Is that what we're here for? No. Paul counted everything that was to his credit as rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. This is a man who was brilliant. This is a man who had credentials that were unmatched in Judaism. He sat under the greatest teacher of his time, Gamaliel. He was conversant with the ways and the teachings of the Greek philosophers. He went to the Greeks and God used him in a very powerful way. But what does Paul say? I counted all rubbish, dung, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Just make sure that you're walking what you know to be true in this hour because the devil will know if we're just talking or if we're walking what we talk. Amen? 
And I promise you, if you are living by faith, the just, the righteous will live by faith. People will know it. And you can walk in confidence that God is with you. So many people are walking with such uncertainty and confusion. He is not the God of confusion. And people who walk by faith walk with confidence. Some people will mistake that as arrogance. It doesn't matter what they think. Walk confidently. It's not self-confidence. It's confidence in God and knowing that He is the one who is directing your paths. That He is your life. He is your future. And you can have all the money and all the success and all the knowledge and all the status in the world, but if you do not have Him living in you and directing you, you have nothing. Absolutely nothing. Amen? So faith is a verb. Faith is not a feeling. In the book of Habakkuk, the prophet was lamenting the fact that here, Judah, the southern tribes, now the northern tribes had already been vanquished by the Assyrians and deported to Assyria. But the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they too had slipped into idolatry and worldliness, immorality, injustice. They had betrayed their Lord. You know, God is grieved when that happens. Do you know how our parent is grieved when a child is unappreciative or a child is resentful or a child is disrespectful or a child wants nothing to do with a parent unless they have money available for them? Do you know how grieved a parent is? Do you know how their heart is filled with grief and sorrow? You can grieve the Holy Spirit. I can grieve the Holy Spirit. And do you know something? If you're sensitive to God and you're walking with God, when you start speaking, there are times I've started speaking certain things and I knew in here that I was grieving the Holy Spirit. Man, I shut my big mouth right in the middle of my sentence. I shut up. And that's tough for a New Yorker to do. It's just in our genes, I guess. Because I knew I was going to grieve the one I love above all. Amen? The pagans would never even imagine that you could grieve their gods. Their gods were not personally involved and in interacting with their creation. But our God is a personal God. He is a father. And so Habakkuk was concerned that Judah, the southern kingdom, were acting in idolatry and ungodliness toward him. And they were unrepentant. He warned them. And so the Lord, and he presented his case to God, and the Lord was pretty much confirming that they were going to be judged. They were going to receive the proper judgment for their idolatry and their betrayal of God. And what really concerned him was that Babylonia was the instrument to bring God's discipline to Judah. But the Lord gives him a vision that he's going to restore his people to their land and God is going to judge the Babylonians for what they have done. And so in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4 See, he, that is Babylonia, is puffed up, that is proud. See, God resists the proud. His desires are not upright. Babylonia's desires are not upright. But the just or the righteous will live by his faith. Listen, the just or the righteous, and we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We don't have our own righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We have the righteousness of Christ because of what Christ did on the cross, spilling his blood for us, taking upon himself our sins and the penalty therein. Amen? So we have his righteousness. When the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus, praise God. 
He doesn't see a sinner because I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And he is the author. Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith. How can I walk in faith apart from him and apart from trusting in him? And friends, everything in the kingdom of God is appropriated through faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Is it becoming ever clear to you how important faith is? And how tragic that we're, we are backing away from teaching the word of God and we're backing away from teaching faith. Because a person who is living in faith is living a godly and an upright and an unselfish life, a consecrated life. Amen? So he says the just or the righteous will live by his faith. If we, we are righteous in Christ, we will live by our faith. It must be my faith. It can't be my parents' faith. It can't be my spouse's faith. It can't be another's faith. It can't be my children's faith. It's my faith. It must be my faith. I must find this faith and I must lay hold of it and possess it. I cannot ride the spiritual coattails of my parents, my spouse, or any other. I must accept responsibility for my walk with Jesus and make this faith my own faith. He is my God. He is my Lord. And this is my faith. And nothing will separate me from him, from his word, or from my faith. Are you determined? You know, we need men and women of conviction who are determined not to move or to swerve or to bend or to buckle to the lies of the devil or to the temptations of our culture. Amen? So the righteous will live by his faith. And he now speaks in verse 5 of Babylonia again. He is arrogant and never at rest. Isn't it interesting? People who are arrogant and prideful they are never at rest or peace. They're always struggling. They're always anxious. They're always restless and jumpy. There's no peace. They can have all the success and all the material wealth in the world, and there's no peace in them. What's the point? So it's interesting. Babylon, Babylonia, had, is conquering the world here, and they're not at rest. And the leaders are despots. The kings are despots. And they're not at rest because they never know who is going to dethrone them. And so it says, because he is, Babylon is as greedy as the grave, like death is never satisfied, he gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the people. Praise God the Lord would judge Babylon. And praise God the Lord would restore his people to their land, which is what we're experiencing today. Amen? The just will live by his faith. In the Hebrew, it is not merely faith. The word is emunah. And emunah is much more than faith. Emunah is a person who not only has faith, but this is a person who is faithful. He is living faith every moment of every hour of every day. Emunah is faith as a lifestyle. I could say I have faith. But emunah will describe a life that is totally surrendered and living in accordance with faith. It's the lifestyle of faith. And there's always hope with the faith. There's ha faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. You have that triad there. Faith, hope, and love. People who walk in faith, walk in hope, and they walk in love. Do you see how important it is to be a man and a woman of faith? 
and to trust God implicitly in all things and to surrender everything in your life to him and put it at his feet and say, God, I don't understand, but I trust in you and I know you love me and you are my Lord, you are my heavenly father, you are my deliverer, you're my savior. And I trust in you to do your will in my life. I trust in you, Lord, even to correct me if I'm on the wrong path and to get me onto the right path. So, if we look at emunah and faithfulness, what is the opposite of emunah? What is the opposite of faithfulness? It is not doubt or unbelief. The opposite of faithfulness is treachery and betrayal. Are you getting that? Someone who is unfaithful has betrayed another. Someone who has been unfaithful has been treasonous, guilty of treachery. And that's how God sees it. That's why the Lord is grieved, the Holy Spirit is grieved when we don't walk in faith. When we walk by sight and we're moved by what we see out in the world. And the world dictates our actions and we are given to the world and the ways of the world, we respond in, in the flesh, which is fear and panic. And we will make terrible decisions concerning us and especially our children. We have to be especially acutely aware of the fact that we make decisions that are critical to the, our children's future. And so we want to know that we are making decisions in faith, depending on God and his wisdom and his guidance for our children. Amen. So the just live by faith. It's a lifestyle that encompasses every act and aspect of their lives. Faith is the way they behave, conduct themselves, and interact with others. It's the way in which one responds to life and to all of its facets. Faith is the way that we react to the life of that we live and the experiences that we have. Whether it's good times or bad times, whether it's injustice or injustice, whether it's in prosperity or poverty, whether it's in adverse adversity or advantage, whether it's in suffering or security, whether it's in pain or peace. Faith is a constant. Faithfulness is a constancy of faith in a man of faith or a woman of faith's lifestyle. The word faith is pistis. Pistis in the, in the Greek conveys the idea of those who are faithful, loyal, reliable, steadfast, devoted, trustworthy, dependable, dedicated, stable, constant, and unwavering. It encompasses all of those things. That's a man or a woman of faith who lives faithfully. Amen? And so, if we live by the Spirit of God, we will reveal those qualities. The Lord is our model because He is perfect and He is faithful. The Bible says, the Psalm says, He is faithful to the faithful. Such faith describes believers who live or walk by the Spirit. This is contrary to walking by the flesh or our own sinful nature which desires to be lazy, uncommitted, undependable, and completely unreliable. So we are men and women of faith. We do not live in accordance with the flesh and the dictates of the flesh. We live by the Spirit of God. And that is how we live a life of victory and overcoming. That's why we, when the world is collapsing around us and the world system is coming to destruction, we can praise and thank God in heaven, that he's on the throne, and he's never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we can count on him. We counted on him in the past, we count on him in the present, and we can count on him in the future. Amen? Is that a yes and amen? That's a people of faith. Shall we stand?